Hello YouTube. So today I'm not going to be looking at any of the uh, lack of morality of the Russian invasion into Ukraine, which I thoroughly disapprove of. But that notwithstanding, I still have a real bugbear for bullshit that, or just the sheer lack of understanding of stuff in the media so this is all off um the bbc but it doesn't really matter they're all basically the same uh about the dreaded vacuum bomb that the the russians have and where are we uh results in a massive uh a, ma a massive blast wave and a vacuum which sucks up all the surrounding oxygen and it's like sorry what how does a blast or an explosion suck up oxygen? Blasts are just expansions of gases. They, they don't suck up any oxygen. And uh, whilst it's true that they do burn um, gasoline, basically, it doesn't really matter, any sort of hydrocarbon, uh, which does burn all of the oxygen. Believe me. If you're actually in the part of the blast where all the oxygen has been burned, lack of oxygen is the least of your concerns. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so let's take a look at how this is reported. They use the um, vacuum bomb today, which is actually prohibited by Geneva Convention. Vacuum bombs ignite a fireball that sucks in all surrounding oxygen. There are. Th it's like. No, that's, that's, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Thermobaric weapon, whose use is condemned by the international community, though it's not confirmed a vacuum bomb was used in this attack. Yeah, so very heavy on the, the use of the word vacuum bomb. And yeah, we'll just take a look at uh, how thermobaric weapons work. Uh, this, okay, bomb lands fine. There is a small burst of charge which nebulizes some cloud of hydrocarbon to basically make a, an explosive cloud, which is a fuel-air mixture. And then it goes boom. And for some reason, the blast only targets humans, which is not how explosions work. Uh, you know, the pressure wave on uh, yeah, any of this will be the same. They, they don't... <laughs> They're just big ass explosions. I, I don't understand if they are banned by Geneva Convention or whatever, but yeah, um, they're basically just large explosions. So let's let's go into roughly how these things work. Yeah, and another thing that absolutely bugs the hell out of me. Massive blast that is capable of vaporizing human bodies. And it's like, no, no. Right. So anyway, where are we? Um, yeah, what you can do is you're going to start off with basically a Monotov cocktail. And that little Monotov cocktail has a little burst of charge in it. And that burst of charge is going to spray fuel everywhere. It's an exploding water balloon, basically. And once you vaporize this into a cloud, uh, yeah, this is all actually quite technically challenging to do, to actually spray this fuel such that it's in a sufficiently fine mist that, um, yeah, this is now a detonatable mixture of gasoline and air. And then you light it. You know, there's a secondary charge in here that basically causes an ignition. And, of course, because it's a detonation, this all burns basically at the speed of sound and creates probably a, I'm going to guess, 100 to 1,000 times over pressure. Um, in there and of course <clears throat> like all highly compressed gases that means it's going to expand and it's that expansion that causes the pressure wave all of this happens in about a millisecond by the way the, the actual detonation these happen extremely quickly and it's the expansion of gas there um, that causes all the problems but that's just a um, yeah the only difference between this and a regular bomb is with a regular bomb you get your TNT and your that that is all detonated in one go and then that just creates a very high um energy density um 
very high pressure gas, which again just expands outwards. And yeah, that it's it's the the explosion that causes the damage. And this is why they call thermobaric weapons. It's the pressure wave that does all the damage. And this is true of fuel air bombs like this. It's pure true of TNT like this. It's also true of nukes. Nukes are primarily um, thermobaric weapons that you just get a really hot ball of gas which expands and the initial expansion of course is supersonic um, and eventually it'll, it, as it expands it gets cooler and what at some point happens is it expands till it's at one atmosphere but of course it's still very hot like 3000 Kelvin or 3000 degrees Fahrenheit it doesn't really matter it's a very hot ball of gas and this is all like one millisecond after the explosion and of course because it's now a one pressure one atmosphere of pressure uh, but it's very hot the density is very low and because it's sitting in an atmosphere that's relatively dense it starts to go up and as it goes up it starts looking like what all nukes uh, sorry all explosions look like which is you get a swirly cloud thing and a stalk at the bottom. So that's why all of these things, you know, whether they're conventional munitions or not, uh, they all end up looking like mushroom clouds because humans, humans' eyes don't work very well on the millisecond time scale. Uh, but they're all basically the same. They generate uh, clouds of um, a ball of high pressure gas. And it's the expansion of that that causes the problem. And let's get a new one up here. So what you're actually looking at is, I'm just going to draw methane because methane is easy. And that's CH4 roughly. See, methane is gas and the most sensible conditions. Um, but it, it wouldn't really matter. You could have this as propane, kerosene, whatever. They all basically have exactly the same energy density. So if you actually separate your methane molecules in air, they're, they're, they always end up fairly close to an oxygen molecule. And if you get these in a flame or a detonating mixture, you get lots of radicals and all that sort of stuff around. And eventually what you're going to get is the oxygen is going to match up with the hydrogens to give H2O, water, and of course carbon dioxide. And these molecules, because you form lots of very high energy bonds, are moving very fast which basically means they're very hot. But the thing is, this doesn't suck in any oxygen at all. It never sucks in oxygen. Right? The, the mean free path of gas molecules at uh, room temperature is on the order of nanometers. Uh, it's about 50 nanometers, I think, is the mean free path of gases. So, you know, for these explosions, th that you, you need the mixture of the fuel and the air to be done very well um, before you actually uh, set your detonation off. And yeah, what they were saying here about, um, yeah, they sort of paint these weapons ash. Uh, they're, they're, they're insidious in that they can go in through windows and doors and all that sort of thing. And it's like, no. Now, you, you blow up one of these things against the side of the building, you will massively diminish its destructive capability. The cloud can penetrate any building, opening, or defense that is not totally sealed. Or it's totally, actually totally sealed would be a disaster um, because there is nothing to equilibrate the pressure. Uh, so you get the full pressure on the side of the building. Uh, but, you know, so the first phase of one of these fuel air bombs is like I was saying, it's basically a water balloon with a little burst of charge. And you have a wall here. Um, so what it would look like normally, let's scrub the wall, is you spray out your your fuel and then you light it up. What happens, however, if you do this next to a building or something, is first of all, you spray a load of your gasoline against the side of the wall where it's not mixed with air and therefore loses its destructive capability. And secondly, um, yeah, okay, technically it can go in through doors, but in many ways, uh, like, like I was saying, 
what really causes the damage is when you've got pressure pushing on one side and nothing to balance it on the other. Um, and in this sense, actually having open doors and such like, it means that you have less overpressure pushing on the building. It's going to be less destructive if you've not if you've got open doors and that sort of thing. Cool. So yeah, well, why are these overpressures bad news bears? And it, it let's just take your typical human. Right? Um, there's 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 Bert the the human, and he sat in an atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere of pressure. Now, one atmosphere of pressure, actually quite a lot. It's about 10 tons uh, per square meter. Uh, yeah, 10 tons is a fairly decent sized truck. And Bert's skin area, Bert being a fairly normal person, is about two square meters. So he's, he's already got like tw um, 20 tons of pressure pushing on him. Now, you might think that's impossible. How can I breathe? Well, the answer is that because the pressure on the inside of his lungs and on the outside of his body is almost exactly the same, typically within millibar, thousandths of an atmosphere, this isn't a problem. Uh, it is, however, a problem if he's got a different pressure pushing on the inside of his lungs and on the outside of his body. At that point, Bert loses the ability to breathe um, with a difference in pressure of about 0 0.1 atmospheres. Uh, you know, at that point, your lungs just aren't strong enough to breathe in or out. Um, now, this becomes... You know, humans are fairly resilient to static pressures. So if Bert climbs to the top of a very tall mountain, say Mount Everest, uh, the atmospheric pressure on the top of that is about a third of an atmosphere. And whilst the air is getting a little thin, Bert there's no problem being up there. Likewise, we can take Bert and we want him to work under under the ocean, so we can put him in a a big pressure container. Uh, you go up to about ten atmospheres. After about ten atmospheres, the air gets a bit soupy, and you you start getting too much oxygen dissolved in your body and all that sort of thing. But it, it, ten atmospheres is roughly what you can do before it becomes a, a real problem um and Bert can live quite happily in there too but Bert cannot take a pressure wave of um one atmosphere right when when we come to delta for it p um Bert will struggle to stay alive with a one atmosphere pressure wave and the reason for that, if you think about it, is, is fairly obvious. The, the, the pressure waves that you get from explosions, um, they don't have much mass in them, but they're traveling at about the speed of sound, which is uh, 1,000 miles per hour, 300 meters per second, that sort of thing. Fairly fast. And a one atmosphere pressure wave um, means... The, you know, at the moment, Bert is sat in an atmosphere and it's one atmosphere is pushing on him from all directions. Uh, when the pressure wave arrives, he's now got 1.1, at, uh, well, two atmospheres pushing on him from that side and only one atmosphere pushing on him from that side, which means the, well, atmospheric pressure is 10 tons per meter squared. So he's being hit by something traveling at about the speed of sound that's giving a pressure of about 10 tons. It's like getting hit by a truck um, traveling at the speed of sound, um, which is why, you know, a one atmosphere pressure wave is bloody lethal. Um, and it also make a mess of buildings and such like. Uh, they take uh, very well to differences in pressure. Um, now, uh, yeah, I can't remember that. I, I didn't. I didn't explain this in terms of of rockets. So let, let's imagine that we've got our rocket. Uh, there we go. It's a rocket engine, and he's got two fuel. He's he's got fuel and non-oxidizer being pumped in here. 
So it's got liquid oxygen on one side and we'll call it liquid methane on the other. And they're being mixed in here and they're then being burned. And the expansion of gas that you get here is, I think it's about 10,000 expansion ratio you get on, you know, going from liquid um, liquid propellants to the, the exhaust gas. Um, that's fairly impressive. Now, the only difference between that and a bomb is these are sort of continuously being mixed in the combustion chamber. Uh, it turns out that you could actually mix these two together and at that it becomes very dangerous because now if you light that up you get a very, you get your factor of 10,000 expansion off it um, in an instant. Uh, fuel air bombs they in principle have the same energy apart from it's not liquid liquid that you're mixing. One of your components is uh, you know it starts off as a liquid and you nebulize it into a into the air. Um, and yeah, then then you light it up and you it, it, it goes like um, all the the previous explosions that we looked at, you get a a big fireball of expanding gas, right? So initially you, the the initial detonation happens in about a millisecond. Then this is at I don't know fifty or hundred atmospheres, that sort of thing uh, of pressure. And it's going to expand outwards until it gets to roughly one atmosphere of pressure. And on on the outside of that, you get the shock wave coming off. And uh, right, so the, the, they're all basically the, the idea that you're going to get a vacuum off this is just bloody stupid. Uh, now there there are there is some element of truth to this. In, and the, the place that you most it's most easily seen is in depth charges. So when you detonate a depth charge, you know, initially it's quite small. And then in the first expansion of the gas, uh, yeah, it pushes, the, the, there's water pressure pushing on this from all sides. And when you get the, the expansion of the gas, um, it tends to overexpand a bit. And so the, there's a bit of a resonance that the, the initial explosion goes boom, takes about a millisecond, and then there's a sort of resonance thing where it shrinks, then grows, then shrinks and grows until it sort of stabilizes, and then it's just a bubble of gas and it rises to the surface. Um, now, you do get elements of this with, um, you know, just fuel air explosions, but they're modest at best. Yeah, the thing that does the, the 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 damage is the big fireball and the expansion of that fireball. That's what creates the pressure wave. Yeah, you know, it's, it's exactly the same as with the nuke. Um, and yeah, so first of all, in whilst it's true that within the fireball there is no oxygen left, anything within the fireball is going to get smashed by the blast wave anyway. So the the, the the lack of oxygen there is kind of an irrelevance. Um, y you know, uh, the exact same is true if you just blow up your TNT. Uh, yeah, there won't be any oxygen in that either because all of the dec all in the fire everything in the fireball is decomposition products from your TNT. So there's exactly as much oxygen after the fuel air bomb as in TNT in, in, in the fireball. But it doesn't matter within the fireball, everything's going to be squashed anyway. Um, and then the idea that it sucks the air out of things, or sorry, no, it wasn't suck the air, it sucks the oxygen out. Which sucks up all the surrounding oxygen. And it's like, no, 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 no. And this thing about vaporizing bodies is also so, so stupid. And so from a thermodynamic perspective, your typical human is roughly um, 100 kilos of water. And that's what humans are. 
and if you want to vaporize your average human the the the, the energy costs are roughly that of boiling 100 kilos of water because yeah you know, and the energy there that you're putting in is basically to break the hydrogen bonds in water and you know roughly what the energy costs of that are um the latent heat of vaporization of water which is about two megajoules per kilogram now the reason this gets interesting is that tnt has an energy density of about four megajoules per kilogram so if you wanted to vaporize someone with tnt your 100 100 kilo person would require about 50 kilograms of TNT to vaporize them. And that's assuming that all the energy from the TNT actually goes into boiling people, which, of course, it won't. You know, there's a heat transfer problem here. That You know, you, you put someone on 50 kilos of TNT, you'll, you'll blow up their body, but you won't actually vaporize them. Um, now, by happy coincidence, virtually all of the hydrocarbons you know what body fat or kerosene gasoline all of these things they basically have the same energy density it's actually about 50 megajoules per kilo but i'm a lazy man so i'm going to call it 40 megajoules per kilogram uh so you know to to vaporize someone only requires uh, the combustion of five kilos of hydrocarbon now you might think that, hang on um, if I want to be a little more specific and say that my human isn't just a hundred kilos of water but is actually um, well almost all life it turns out is uh, two-thirds water and one-third bio biomolecules so that's things like fats proteins uh, lipids dna and all that sort of thing and all of that roughly burns with a similar energy density to fat yeah you know, first degree approximations so you know it turns out there is actually enough energy in in the bio in people for them to vaporize um and yeah if you actually put flesh or any biomaterial into a hundred percent oxygen atmosphere and light it up it burns very spectacularly i did it once with a piece of chicken um very very impressive uh, thankfully you, oh, the partial pressure of oxygen um is relatively low um here on earth but uh yeah at higher oxygen uh, there there is enough energy in the 30 odd kilos of biomass in your body to vaporize it completely uh, but the uh, it, this doesn't actually uh, help you i mean it, this is just the thermodynamics uh that's the minimum amount of energy you would need in reality there's a heat transfer process required here that basically you know a five kilo fuel air bomb in principle has the same energy density as 50 kilos of tnt in principle um th so you know i mean they're, they're they're higher energy density but the bottom line is they're just regular bombs right there's there's nothing special about them um so, you know so when you get all this stuff about them sucking the air out of people you know and these warheads they're they're going to be comparable energy density to regular explosives so uh yeah they're they're not as as crazy as they're being portrayed in the media um in fact i'm not even so sure whether there is enough energy density in a nuke to vaporize someone and you might think i'm just way off the reservation in saying that but let me let me explain to you why i have skepticism about that i'll, I'll look into this actually I'm, I'm interested now um so when you set off a nuke you have about 10 kilos of plutonium and it's surrounded by lots of regular explosives and all that regular explosives does is it compresses the plutonium and when you do that you split up the plutonium nuclei 
and they release a awful lot of high energy particles and they also release some very high energy x-rays and it's mostly the very high energy x-ray flux that comes off of your plutonium let's do it on this one that heats the surrounding air here up to you know millions of degrees kelvin which is what causes the expanding gas which is what causes the blast in nukes and yeah that so the fireball on these things is actually now i can do the calculation i'm working out the the fireball um on small nukes let's say is 10 meters um and so that's 10 meters absorbs almost all of the x-rays and at that, there is a uh, there is roughly a thousand fold difference between the density of gas and the density of liquid. So, go, I'm struggling now. That's ten. Uh, I might be doing this wrong. Uh, I'm not so sure. I'm going to have to come back to this. But the, the, the basic question is, um, if you have a human actually sat within the, the fireball, um, if all of the x-ray flux is absorbed on the surface of the person, then you're going to burn off a load of the surface. But if there are if there is no x-ray flux going through the rest of your body, there's no heat being dumped there, right? So the pressure wave will kill you. I mean, don't get me wrong, but um, I don't know whether there's actually enough energy flux there to vaporize someone. I, I suspect if you get very close, then the answer is... Actually, it's, it's not even clear. It all depends on the energy of the x-rays coming off and the penetration of the... Of the um, essentially water and so I, I i do know going back uh to some of the early tests um there was one of these early tests where they had the nuke in a big metal can or something um and th there was a big metal plate on the top of it and they can see it in the explosion being shot off with more than escape velocity and Actually, I, I, there's, there's another thing like this. Sorry, I'm rambling now, but uh, there was this idea to launch spacecraft with nukes. And the reason it works is because the penetration of the x-rays with something like steel is nowhere, it's, it, it's not that deep. Um, so, you know, if the idea is that you have a big plate with your spacecraft on, sat on top of it, that's your spacecraft. Let's make it look a little more spacecraft like there you go. There's our spacecraft. But it's got a big metal plate on the bottom. And you drop nukes out the bottom. And of course, you get this massive x ray flux off these things. And some of that actually gives velocity to the, 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 the spacecraft. Um, and that's only possible. Um, yeah, there's only like a factor of seven difference between the density of steel and the density of humans. Humans are about, well, they're basically water. So it, it's um, one kilo per liter. And steel, I think, is about seven kilos per liter. You know, it's, it's not that much difference between them. So, yeah, I'm not even so sure you actually get vaporized by nukes, let alone by, uh, yeah... Um, the, the, the dreaded vacuum bomb, which will <laughs> keep a lot of vaporizing human bodies. Anyway, um, yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to do a little... Sorry, I rambled a bit on the end there, but... Okay, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that. If you did, drop a thumbs up on it, and I will see you next time.